Beautiful Marathon. Today we are going to talk about how to play Taverns and Dragons. So the first part of this video I'm going to cover just simply how to play for uh, all human players. And then at the end I'm going to cover how to activate the AI if you want to play solo. So you are going to see a few things out here that you would not see if you were just playing multiplayer. For example, these two little standees here would not be there unless you're playing solo. This board is the Druid board, which is your solo opponent. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, also, you know, normally these things would be standing up in standees, but I have them laying down so you guys can better see where they are on the board. Same thing with my meeples here. I've laid them down so you can better see because they are different. They each have unique uh, abilities and we're gonna discuss those here in just a second. So. The name of the game here is to end up with the most prestige points uh, for your tavern. So my tavern for this particular game is the Griffin's Nest. If you are playing, um, there's many modules. Let me start there. There's many modules for this game. I'm not gonna cover all of them in this rule set. Uh, most of them are pretty straightforward, but it does make for a nice uh, bit of variety uh, and replayability. But if you are not using the tavern powers module, basically the only difference is the colors of your meeples. You know, the, the fact that I'm the Griffin's Nest wouldn't mean anything different from the other ones. But I am playing with taverns powers, which is this little uh, token over here. We'll look at that here in a little bit. <clears throat> but as your tavern, you are sending around your little minion meeples here to collect ingredients, bring them back to the city here behind the castle walls, drop them off, and then you can craft your recipes, which are over here. You can also hire, as you earn gold, you can hire these heroes who are gonna give you asymmetrical actions to help your minions, give you favors, things like that. Um, what's really nice is that I've yet to see a duplicate in, uh, in, in the stack. Basically, every hero is uniquely different from the next. Some of them are close, but they're all uniquely different. So, with that in mind, uh, and this little track here, tiny little track going around the outside of the board is the prestige track. So, this tiny little piece here is what I'll be tracking my prestige with. So, at the beginning of every round, and we play seven rounds no matter what, this is the round tracker right here. And you can see that between the rounds, various things are going to happen, uh, but they don't happen every round. We'll get back to that as well. But at the beginning of every round, each player is going to take their five dice in their player color and roll them out. Make sure you set them aside, keeping the faces up that you rolled. Now, at this point, everybody's gonna go around and count up their total. So for me, I would have 16 here. Maybe somebody else has uh, 11 and another person rolled very poorly and they have eight. Well, whoever has the lowest roll gets the first player token. So they would get this and anybody, including possibly the first player, anybody that rolls 10 or less gets a pity coin. At least that's what we've been calling it, the, the, the pity coin, but you get a money. Uh, ideally rolling higher is better in this game. This is actually a really lucky roll because there's only one four on the die, there's only one three on the die, and there's two twos and two ones. So these are not standard d6s. Once you've determined player order, in player order starting with the first player, each person, each human player is going to take one of their die. It's up to them which one they choose. They don't have to go highest or lowest. They're going to choose a die and they're going to take an action with that die. This is technically a die placement game. It's a worker placement game, but the dice is your worker. There are four things you can do with your die on your turn. The first one is you can come to the come inside the city and go to the bank and get some gold. To be able to go to this spot, you have to have a four. So only a four could go right there. If you do, you get three coins, no one else can go there. Only a three can go right here and you would get two coins. So not even my four can go right there to gain two coins, threes only. Then a two to get two coins and then any die, number, face, whatever, and any number of dice can go into this larger box just to get a single coin. So if I had a one, 
uh, I could throw it there or if somebody else had filled up these I could throw my die there all right you can also gain energy energy is represented by these blue tokens and that's simply just to give you something to count and it's a nice little you know 3d tactile thing in the game but you go down here to this um, blue energy pit or whatever you want to call it and whatever number you place in there is the number of blue energy you get. So if I placed a four here, I would get four energy into my supply. If I only placed a two there, I would only get two energy. And since this is a large square, any number of dice can go into this square. So um, basically you, you can't be cut off from gaining energy and you can't be cut off from gaining at least one coin. Also, and you're certainly not going to be able to do this at the beginning of the game. Um, it's probably going to be a round or two into the game, but you can place a die on one of these recipes and craft that recipe. In order to do that, however, you have to have the ingredients listed at the top. You have to have them in your supply and be able to turn them back in and or it's called your pantry. You have to have them in your pantry because this is the supply over here trade them into the supply, you then gain this recipe, which other than the flavor text, which is actually quite funny, all it is is victory points. You would move up your marker, in this case 12, you would also move up your marker whatever number the die value is. So generally this isn't important, but end game scenarios where things are getting close, it may make a difference whether you spend a four to craft a recipe or a two, uh, because you're gonna get that that much additional points. In this case, you get four additional points. And if it's one of the bottom two recipes, you're gonna get bonus little uh, VP there as well. So this one would be 14 plus my die. So in that case, it would be 18. Every round, the bottom one's gonna shift off and they'll all shift down. And every time you uh, craft one, they all shift down. So the oldest ones are gonna be the ones sitting here on the two and one space. The newest ones are gonna be up here at the top. Heroes, however, do not shift. You don't uh, call the end one at the end of the round or anything like that. They basically stay up there. The last thing you can do, and this is the biggest action you can take on your turn, is to activate one of your meeples. So let's come back here to our tavern board and take a closer look at our tavern board here. So you'll notice that there is a spot for each one of your meeples here, and each one of them has a different picture. That's because each one has its own special power. My little meeple in boots here, he always goes an additional one space around the track. Now what I mean by around the track, I'm referring to these oval locations here, or this circle one, that go around and you always have to move clockwise around the track and whichever die you use to activate that minion is the number of spaces they're going to move. So if I activated my minion with a two, he would go one, two. You always have to move and you always have to move the entire amount. This guy, however, always moves an additional one. So he would go one, two, three. That's not a choice. He's, he's a runner. Future me here who is going back in time because I realized I left off two important components about moving your minion. So remember you activate your minion by spending a die and they have to move that value. Um, Meeples in boots here has to move that value plus one. But there's certain spots on the board where you can take a shortcut, for example here. So at any point in time you could go one, two, three, four, and meeples and boots here could actually, he would actually make it all the way around. There's another shortcut over here. It's not really a shortcut, but it's this location over here, this elder tree. Anytime you pass by or end your turn on the elder tree, you can gain a reroll token, which is right hither. So reroll token allows you to reroll a single die, whether it be an action die or a hunt die here and you don't have to end your turn on the elder tree you can simply take that path to go you know you would you're essentially getting back to the city gate one turn one movement point longer um, but you can take that branch as well also and this is very important to unload your ingredients and heal your wounds you have to be in the city and you have to land in the city exactly so if I were here 
and I tried to activate my backpack guy with a two, I would go one, two, and go right past the city and be stuck still carrying all my ingredients and have to go at least this far around before I can attempt to get back to the city. Again, you don't have to activate a minion, so if he's right here and I didn't roll any ones, I could simply leave him there and hopefully I roll a one the next round. A little tip for you, Meeples and Boots is never able to make it home from this spot because he always has to go at least one, two. That's the smallest amount of movement he can do. So if you are planning ahead, don't ever send him to here to end his turn, at least if you are wanting to unload his ingredients on the next round. So that is a very important rule. There's a little bit of back and forth questions about whether you had to land here exactly, but the designers did confirm on BGG that that is the case, and it does lead to the strategy of the game utilizing things like portals and heroes and things like that to make sure you stop right here. So that is it for minion movement. Back to the regularly scheduled. This gentleman here, he can fight dragons without taking a scratch. We're gonna get back to fighting dragons here in a minute, but just know that that's his special power with his shield and uh, head armor there. He can, he's good at fighting dragons. And this last individual here, you'll notice that there are two spots underneath these two guys. This guy has three. He's got the backpack. He can actually carry three ingredients around the board, whereas these guys can only carry up to two ingredients around the board. When it's your turn uh, and you want to activate a minion, you simply take whatever die you are spending and place it on top of the minion's picture because you can only activate each minion once per round unless there are certain effects basically hero cards or maybe locations that allow you to activate a minion twice but the general rule of thumb is that each minion is only going to activate once you do not however have to activate any of your minions on your within a round you could completely leave them all free of dice and just spend your dice crafting recipes gaining energy getting gold coins it's entirely up to you while I have this board over here, let's quickly talk about Tavern Powers. This is a module that you can play with or without, but simply what you do with this token is, is that every time you roll a one, so what Tavern Powers is doing is giving you a little bit of a bonus if you roll poorly in the game, because ones tend to hurt. It takes you longer to get around the board. You can get less coins, less energy with it. So the higher, the better. They Tavern Powers allows you to Get a little bit of compensation for rolling poorly every time you roll a one you get to advance your little marker here and it keeps advancing keeps advancing you don't gain anything yet and then at any point in time on your turn you can push this all the way back and gain whatever it was sitting on or passed over so if i had pushed it to here i would only gain a reroll token and i would have to start over but if i bided my time and had rolled this many ones, then I could get this effect, which I believe is move a meeple to any other location. Yeah, uh, similar to the portal here. So basically a portal move. Um, so that is tavern powers. So I'm gonna put this back over hither. All right, so activating a minion you get to do a lot more than just move your minion. So the rest of these actions that are all optional, moving, you have to do, it's not an option. You have to move your minion and you have to move them the number that's on the die. This guy has to move one extra. The rest of the stuff is optional and it can be done either before or after your movement. So that makes a difference if you're say here you could pick up this flower or you could wait until you get all the way around the board and pick up this spice. Or the other things you can do with your minion other than collect ingredients. So there's some that are printed on the board that are always gonna be available. And then there's others that they are the token and you would pick those up and they're no longer available until these little magic bursts here. So twice during the game, we reseed the board. They can pick up an ingredient, it has to go 
into one of their slots on your board and once you've filled up those slots those minions are stuck with those ingredients unless they take a wound or some other effect tells you to kick out an ingredient you cannot swap ingredients you can't kick one out to gain something you think is better you're stuck with those until your meeple has made it back to the gates which is the only place they can unload they can pick up an ingredient they can visit a location which are these squares in the middle so if you are at a location your, your meeples only ever go into these oval and circle spots around the board but if they're adjacent to one of these spots so to visit the portal you have to be either here or here you can visit a location pay the cost and these X's are here because I have set up for a two-player game so you would cover these up normally they would give you two chances each round to use a location now whoever uses it first basically has cut it off for the rest of the round but you pay your whatever it costs so here's a, an energy here's two energy here's a coin plus lose two prestige this is the black market and here is two energy each of these is double-sided and there's an extra one in the box that you know didn't even fit so again replay value you get to use the location or you get to hunt a dragon yeah, I say or because dragons are going to be sitting on one of the there's always going to be a dragon out unless he's been defeated but um, two dragons are going to come out during the game and they're going to squat on these locations if there's a dragon on a location you can't use that location you instead fight the dragon it is optional to fight the dragon um, and we'll talk about the benefits of fighting the dragon here in a minute but remember I said you can do these actions before or after your movement in any order you so fit and they're all optional which means I could say for example I'm just going to use this little uh, Riven um, here and say he's here at this location so this location is blocked I could at the beginning of my turn use this location which allows me to uh, re-roll action dice I could use this location I could then go one two I could pick up this ingredient and I could fight this dragon all of that is legal because I either did it before or after my movement also on your turn you can utilize one of your heroes so at any point on your on any of your turns it has to be your turn so you can't steal something from somebody else you can spend money that you've accumulated the cost is up here in the upper right on a hero once the hero is in your tavern you would simply turn him sideways exhaust him to gain his effect in this case you would move your minion to any area this little minion symbol in a square just means that this action has to do with a minion uh, you can't do this without you know having activated a minion to, to use it they also have a little bonus ingredient here that at any point during the game you can spend an energy you're supposed to put it down there and cover it up because you only get it once per game once that is used up you can't get that mushroom from the tunnelologist again they're also going to give you two victory points you don't count these until the end of the game because there are cards that allow you to swap them out or um, you know discard them or, or things like that so you don't necessarily you're not necessarily going to end up with this guy at the end of the game you would turn him you would keep him exhausted until you pass over these spots with the mugs so the mugs of ale mean that these guys have all been paid in beer and they are refreshed again that essentially is everything you can do your options of what you can do on your turn so each person goes through and takes five actions within a round at the end of the round you're going to take back your five dice you're going to remove any payments that were made to these locations essentially clearing them off so other people can use them the next round you're going to kick out the bottom recipe and reveal a new one and then you're going to pass uh, move the king marker here and do any effects that we passed over so we already talked about the little starburst here new ingredients come out we also talked about the little mug of beer your minions or your heroes get refreshed you'll notice right here in the middle and at the very beginning is a dragon symbol that's when we're going to flip over a dragon 
and in this case a new dragon comes out so if this first one is still around this one kicks it out and this one takes over so let's take a peek at one of our dragons here so this is would be our first dragon now he's got a standee in here somewhere I I'm playing the game I would normally find his thing I would put it on a standee and then the B up here in the upper right corner tells you which location he squats at so in this case he goes a B he covers up this location so I can no longer use the portal until I get rid of the guardian well how do we get rid of the guardian we hunt the dragon when you hunt the dragon you are attempting to cover up uh, with these little wound tokens here all of these slots unless you're playing with four players you can ignore the line that says four plus on it so in this case one two three four once all four of these lines are completely covered the the weapon symbols then this dragon is defeated he would leave the location and uh, if you do it before round four or round five then you would get some respite from dragons but there's a very important ingredient that you can only get from dragons, and that's the dragon meat. So the only time, and you'll notice that some recipes call for dragon meat, the only way to get dragon meat is to go dragon hunting. Now, when this dragon comes out, you're going to activate this effect here at the top. For this guy, it's Call of Nature. Then, when you fight the dragon, you're going to be rolling these dice here. These three special dice that everybody shares. You'll notice that each symbol or each side has a unique symbol on it. So say you roll a bow and arrow. In this case, you would put a wound marker right there. And then let's say you roll a sword. Well, in this case, you could put a wound marker right there. You've completed this line and you yourself for completing the line gains a meat token and two prestige. But let's say you rolled instead, where is it, the ax. And these are the only two dice you rolled. Anytime you're fighting the dragon, you have to place down tokens that meet the outcome of your dice roll if available. So in this case, you would put one here and you have to put one there. You did not cross through either one of these lines, so you don't get those tokens, but maybe that you're the first one and you could have used this one here and gotten that token. Either way, you can say, oh, I didn't, I'm not able to kill the entire line. I'm not gonna do it because somebody else could come behind me. That's not an option. You have to cover them up if they're available. There's a couple other die faces on here that we should note. Anytime there's a scratch symbol, your minion takes a wound. So you would come over here to your minion and you would have to put a wound token filling up one of their available slots. Or if they have any two a full set of ingredients, you have to kick out an ingredient, discard it to take a wound. Anytime your minion makes it back to the city though and unloads, they also get to heal their wounds. So these would come off. Our knight in shining armor here though, does not take wounds. No matter how many are rolled, he is impervious to wounds. He's your dragon fighter. If you are the last person to, well, hold on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Last die face I want to talk about is this one. If you roll this die face and are not able to re-roll it or change it or anything, you activate this right here. So in his case, he removes all damage markers placed during this hunt. Um, other ones are, are bad. So that's that symbol. This symbol happens when the dragon first appears. If you are the person who puts down the final token that completes all of the, in this case, four lines, you not only get whatever you earned, but you would also get one of these three uh, dragon token trophies. So these would sit face down, you would randomly select one, and essentially these are all victory points that you can keep secret at the end of the game. You just don't know whether you're getting the six or the two, things like that. There's some other tokens here. These go along with the dungeon. So if I utilize the dungeon, I get to pick one of these random tokens. This could be uh, instant prestige, it could be a weapon token to use against a dragon. There's also one wound in here, so uh, tricky, 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 take it for what you will. So there's lots of tokens like this in the game that you'll only put out during setup if you have the specified location out. So that's fighting a dragon. Remember, you have to fight a dragon 
on a minion's turn. So you have to have used a die to activate a minion, run them around, and at some point, if you choose to, if you are adjacent to that dragon, so in this case you'd have to be here or here, you can fight said dragon. Or if you had, say, the trophy huntress here, you could activate a minion and hunt from any area, and you would ignore the fire effects if rolled on the die. So that's what that's the kind of thing the heroes can do for you. Some pretty cool stuff. And that's it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You'll notice there are a few other symbols. They look like horseshoes here on the game board. These are for the events module, which I have left in the box for now. It's pretty straightforward. Once you uh, pass over these, you would flip over a card and everybody has to do what it says. There's some good luck ones and some bad luck ones. And you can see they just kind of good luck, bad luck, good luck, bad luck. Or I don't know which, which direction is which, but you would just do what it says. You play through seven rounds. At the end of seven rounds, you will have already counted your recipe prestige points, but at this point you're gonna count up any hero points, any face down tokens you might have hidden away, and you would get a single prestige point for any leftover ingredient in your pantry that hasn't been spent. That is how you play Taverns and Dragons. Now, Let's talk about how to play Taverns and Dragons solo. So this here is the Druid board. On the back side of it is the Goblin module. So you cannot use the Goblin module and play solo at the same time. They need the same board. But this is the Druid's board. And this is also an objective card here, which comes along with the solo mode. Then we have the Druid's deck of action cards, and the Druid then gets a set of his own dice that also matches his little prestige tracker here. Uh, there are certain modules that don't work with solo mode. They list out which ones do in the solo rule book, and Tavern Powers uh, that we discussed earlier is one of those, so we're good. You can also play with missions and events, I believe. So. Essentially, you are playing a two-player game of Taverns and Dragons, and the Druid always gets the first turn. On his turn, he is simply going to flip over one of these cards and take the action listed. So in this case, let's take a closer look at this. It says the capture action. You're going to roll one of his dice. So you would roll it out. It's a two. The Druid gets a hero from the market. In this case, he would get the Tunnelologist. He simply uses this die, we would put it off somewhere in some exhausted area, but he would get the Tunnelologist. He's never gonna use the Tunnelologist for his action. He simply is gonna gain these points at the end of the game. He doesn't have to pay gold. He doesn't work in any gold. He doesn't work in any energy. He doesn't worry about any of that stuff. He simply gains that, sets it aside. Let's look at the rest of his cards here in more detail because there's not very many of them. Um, so what's next? We have Bob the Golem here. Here we're gonna move the Golem. You don't actually roll a die. You see there's no die symbol here. You're gonna move the Golem ahead on the track. He's never gonna take, um, he's never gonna take the shortcut here. He's just gonna move to the next location that contains a wild flower, which is this blue one here. When he does, um, if there is a minion, someone else's minion here, he fights that minion and you basically roll out the dice and certain things happen. It's in the rule book, uh, very easily explained, but he can damage you or you could damage him, which means you would place a wound token here. If you damage him three times, boom, boom, he's actually deactivated. You would lay, lay down, it says to lay down his standee. Uh, in this case, we would probably put it off to the side and he is not he's not gonna mess with you until his card comes back up again. In that case, the Druid re-energizes him on his turn, and then we move on. Wherever the, golem mean, wherever the Golem is then, that means that if you end your movement on his space, or if he ends his movement on your space, you guys fight. So he essentially kind of blocks off that space, uh, or makes it more difficult, kind of like the dragon. We have Pillage here. Pillage says roll the die and place this die on the matching tile to block the location. 
So you would roll the die, in this case, I know this isn't his, but here you would block off location number four. It's a little odd to me that they gave these locations A, B, C, D, but now they're wanting to count them one, two, three, four, but that's, that's a minor gripe. In this case, you would place the die down there. It would stay there. So let's put his, let's put this one here, like so. That means for the rest of the round, I cannot visit this location. It's like there is a dragon there. He has blocked it off. He has Nob, the wyvern, or wyvern? I never know how to pronounce this, the little dragon dude. So Nob here, he wants to gather dragon eggs. So he's going to go to wherever there's a dragon egg. Now, just like the golem wants to go to where there's a blue flower, they don't pick them up, at least on easy mode here. They just go to the location that there is a dragon, and then, in the, in the, so he would stop here, then he would stop here because there's a dragon egg, and then he would fly all the way around here, and he always stops at the city gate. When he stops at the city gate, the druid crafts a recipe. He chooses the lowest prestige recipe to craft, and he simply takes it, puts it over by his board, and he gains the prestige points listed. So the more times the knob goes around the board here, the more recipes the druid will craft. We have Curse. Here he's going to place damage markers to fill up the topmost row, unfilled row of the dragon board. And he would gain any prestige points listed. He's not going to gain any dragon meat, at least on easy mode. All right, so this is him fighting the dragon. And then last but not least, we have Robbery. Roll the die, and it's going to go into the dedicated slot. So here, it would go on a two. If two is already taken, he would simply put his die there. But again, he doesn't take any money. He doesn't work in money. He doesn't gain any money. He's simply just blocking off these locations, making it more difficult for you. This is not a beat your own score, though, because he is going to be counting up prestige based on the recipes he crafts. Every time Nob makes it around, he crafts a recipe. And the heroes that he gains uh, every time he draws that action card. Now, each one of these cards in the box has a what they call spicier version. Since this is a recipe crafting game, he you can see he's got some jalapenos on him, some habaneros. Each card has a spicy version. So for example, the spicy version of Bob the Golem, he would pick up this uh, thing and add it to his board here. Nob, spicy version Nob, would pick up uh, not only the dragon egg, but also craft the highest uh, prestige recipe. So in this case, he would do the 17 instead of the nine. Uh, so you can see where I'm going here with this. Uh, I think the higher version of uh, the hero one, he gains this then and then gains it again, things like that. So they get spicy. You can increase or decrease the difficulty of your solo game by simply adding or choosing how many spicy cards to add in the game. So I believe there's six of these cards. So for a really hard game, you would play with all six spicy cards. For a medium game, you would replace three of the easy cards with spicy cards. That's how you change the difficulty in the game. If you are so if you are playing on one of the more difficult um, settings, so you have at least one spicy card. In this instance, I don't have any spicy cards, so he's never going to gain ingredients or fury. But the spicy cards will have him picking up ingredients and gaining fury, which he would place here. Every time he fills up this with four things, he crafts again another recipe. In this case, he crafts the bottom one, no matter what it is, gains those points, those go away, and he goes to fill it up again. So again, this is all ramping up the difficulty or how easily he crafts recipes, making him harder increasing the difficulty of the game. The last thing I want to talk about here is this objective card here, which is interesting. Um, to my knowledge, this is not a module you're supposed to play with outside of the solo mode. But what this does is give you a objective to try and hit, in this case, by round three. If you do, you, are, you gain three prestige points. So this one here is the most recipes crafted that contain a mushroom. 
are the most mushrooms you have on crafted recipe cards because some of them might have two uh, mushrooms here but say I was able to craft these two recipes before round three before the end of round three and then the druid had crafted this one I would win because I have essentially two mushrooms in my recipe box and he only has one here so anytime you'll notice that there's there's kind of two different pictures there's pictures of something on a plate it's usually a recipe and then there's pictures on what appears to be like paper or papyrus or something like that the plates have to do with the recipes the paper looking ones have to do with hero cards so in this case you would want to have the most uh, weapon symbols from hero cards for example the trophy huntress here has the weapon symbol means you could spend an energy to get a freebie token or instantly get that to hit a dragon with so whoever has the most of those within their heroes would gain this objective that's by the end of round five and then here by the end of round seven or the end of the game whoever has the most recipes that contain the spice the going on spice uh, would gain seven points so I honestly don't see why you couldn't use this module in multiplayer uh, but it is strictly listed as part of the solo game instructions but take that for what you will so that's it ladies and gentlemen that is how you play taverns and dragons both the standard rules so when you're playing solo you play out your turns exactly the same you roll out your dice you pick one per turn you activate your minions um, the druid cheats a little bit by just basically getting some recipes for free you can ramp up his difficulty as you see fit he does need some dice occasionally to roll but uh, he doesn't always uh, use them once you once he has taken five actions he is done you are done if he happens to draw a card and can't take that action uh, for example like if the four is already filled and he rolls a four on the robbery card he technically doesn't take that action he doesn't deal in gold so it doesn't matter whether he puts a die there or not um, same thing for uh, if you roll or to have rolled a two here and the dragon's already blocking it, he just doesn't take that action. Um, so if he ever draws a card and can't take the action, he simply passes uh, for that round, doesn't get an action. It's not like he draws another card or anything like that. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know in the comment section below. I will do my best to answer them. Um, a little tip that took me, I did not realize at first, but the back of the rule book explains what all these symbols mean but not in a way i would have preferred i was looking through the rule book to say "Ooh, what does this symbol mean the little funky square squiggly arrow there's nowhere in the rule book where it shows that symbol and tells you what it means what you have to do is look at this picture remember there's no title on this location then look for these tiny little pictures here and say "Ooh, that matches that matches so this is the enchanted runes location reroll any number of your available action dice so that's what that location does ah I was scouring the rule book back and forth looking for this symbol and wasn't realizing that these tiny little pictures actually match up with a portion of these locations I have no idea why they made these pictures so small I have no idea why they didn't put a name at the top of these locations to make it easier at least with the heroes they did give them a name so for example who do we have here the mentalist whose tiny little picture does match his head but his name is here and his name is there so some of them need some explaining to do uh, it gives you those explanations here that's on the back of the rule book took me a little while to figure that out on our first play so that's going to do it, ladies and gentlemen, for this how to play video of Taverns and Dragons. Again, let me know if you have any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. Up next on the channel, hopefully I will be getting in a, a playthrough, a solo playthrough of Taverns and Dragons so you can see the game in action. Uh, once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.